Today we are going to talk about momentum. We're going to introduce the concept of momentum and how it's related to something called impulse. So let's start with good old Newton's second law, F equals ma. And let's rewrite it here. Uh, remember, acceleration is just the time derivative of a velocity, so I can rewrite this as dv dt. And mass, we're going to do this for a situation where it's a constant mass, so I'm going to pull the mass inside the derivative. So I have the derivative of mv with respect to t. Okay, so that's where we're going to get our idea for momentum. So let's just de define the momentum to be mass times velocity. So it's quantity that's related to velocity, and it's equal to the mass times the velocity. That means we can write now our Newton's second law as d momentum dt. And we are going to see very soon how this concept of momentum is very helpful to us. All right, so this is what we just did. We started with uh, Newton's second law and we derived an expression basically relating the force is equal to the time rate of change of momentum. So when you exert a force on something, you are changing its momentum with respect to time. That's a sort of more direct relationship. I'll uh, just calculate a couple simple ones here. For this goat, uh, we can calculate the momentum of the goat. It's just going to be m times v, right? So the momentum of this goat will be 80 kilograms times 10 meters per second, and we end up with 800 kilogram meters per second. That's an unfortunate set of units. We don't have any special units for momentum, but it's uh, kilograms meters per second. And for the bird, the momentum for the bird will also be the mass of the bird times the speed of the bird. These two objects are going at the same speed, but one weighs a lot more than the other, has a lot more mass than the other, and they have vastly different um, momenta. So there's the momentum of two objects. What does it mean? Well, two objects with the same speed, the one with more mass has more momentum. And that's going to be important for things like collisions, right? Um, we can use this to rewrite kinetic energy in a certain way that comes in handy sometimes. So if I just write this as uh, just in terms of magnitudes, right, p equals mv, or v is equal to the momentum divided by the mass. So let's just rewrite the kinetic energy in terms of momentum. So if I start with kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, I'm going to plug in for v, so it's 1 half m, and then for v it's p over m squared. So we have an m on top, two m's on the bottom, we end up with p squared over 2m. It's another way to look at kinetic energy. And we will see that again in the near future. So what is, you know, what is momentum? Well, here, just sort of a couple examples where we want to think about the momentum of an object, right? Here's a rocket. It, ha it has a momentum that depends on its mass and its velocity, right? And one of the things that it does is it expels stuff backwards. It loses mass and it propels mass backwards and that causes it to accelerate forwards. So it's accelerating forward. So this is one um, way we can use momentum is to understand the acceleration of rockets because it's a really, really complicated system because the mass of the rocket is changing as it expels gas backwards. We will talk about that uh, before, you know, before the semester is over some more. So the rocket accelerates, its velocity changes. Another simpler example, right? This is just a bird traveling in that direction, V, and it has a certain amount of momentum. And the important thing to note here is that the momentum and the velocity are pointing in the same direction. The momentum is just a velocity vector times a number that depends on the mass. So another thing to remember is that the velocity and the momentum are pointing in the same direction. That's one point to note, right? Velocity vector is similar to uh, is similar to momentum in that they both are vectors and they point in the same direction. Well, kinetic energy, this one here, is not a vector, right? That's an important thing to note, is that it is not a vector, and it depends on, right? Remember, we saw that kinetic energy depends on the momentum squared over 2m, and that's just the magnitude of the momentum squared. So kinetic energy is a, a value that depends on the momentum squared, and that's a little bit different than momentum. Uh, here's an example of uh, from a textbook, right? 
If I have a cue ball that's rolling at a certain speed, it's rolling at a speed of 3.24 meters per second at an angle of 25 degrees with respect to the x-axis. And this is its mass. Well, we can easily find the ball's momentum. So to find the momentum, right, you just look here and the momentum is mv. So that's easy. Uh, mv uh, you just take the mass 0.164 times the velocity. Now if I want to break it into x and y components, right, here's, uh, I would take this here angle to be theta, and if I want to break that momentum into x and y components, then py is just going to be p times sine theta, and px is going to be p times the cosine of theta. So we can rewrite this as p cosine theta, or mv cosine theta and py is just p sine theta or mv sine theta and we plug in all the numbers right we plug in theta is 25 degrees the velocity is 3.24 the uh, mass is 0.162 kilograms we get that the x component is about 0 0.476 kilograms meters per second and that the y component is about 0 0.222 kilograms meters per second. So things like uh, momentum can be broken into components just like velocity. Um, let's consider a ball coming in with some initial momentum towards the batter. The batter swings at the ball and during the collision between the bat and the ball there is uh, during the collision, there is a transfer, right? There's a force, the, the, sorry, the bat is exerting a force on the ball. And after the collision, there's a final momentum of the ball as it's traveling in the opposite direction. And that is sort of summarized in how we rewrote Newton's laws. Here's, or Newton's second law. Here's Newton's second law. Instead of dp dt, I wrote it as delta p over delta t, uh, which is fine if it's a constant force. But f net is equal to delta p over delta t. Right? So I exert a force on it for a certain amount of time, and that results in a change in momentum. So another way to rewrite that is I move the delta t over, and I say, well, the change in momentum is due to a force being applied for a certain amount of time. A force being applied for a certain amount of time, we're going to call that the impulse. That's the definition of an impulse. Is it's uh, For a constant force, it's just force times the amount of time that the force is applied on the object. So we can say that the impulse applied on the ball results in a change in momentum, right? An impulse is just a force for a certain amount of time, and that results in a change in momentum of the ball. And we can solve all kinds of fun problems uh, using that. So I'd like to do a few to sort of get the hang of it. So for example here, a force of 20 newtons is applied for four seconds to a one kilogram avocado that, it, that is at rest. We can solve this. What uh, is the change in momentum and what is the change in velocity? Well, first let's write down all our knowns. So the force is 20 newtons. Uh, the amount of time is four seconds. And the mass of the avocado, it's a very big avocado, is one kilogram. And with that, we can solve both our problems. So let's see, what is the change in momentum? Well, so we're asking for the change in momentum. Well, we have equation relating change of momentum to impulse, right? So we have that the change of momentum is equal to the impulse. And the impulse, uh, we're going to do it without, um, we're going to do it without vectors. We're just going to do it simply. We'll, we'll deal with vectors when we get to two dimensional stuff a little bit later. But um, so the impulse, remember, is just the force times the amount of time that the force is applied. So if I apply a force of 20 newtons for four seconds, I at four times 20, I end up with 80 kilograms meters per second. So that's that. Uh, I can solve the other question now. What is the change in velocity? Well, we found the change in momentum. So now we can find what's the change in velocity. Well, we know what v initial is, it's zero, it starts at rest. So that's another known here that we could add here. v initial is zero meters per second. So now we know the change of momentum, we can use it to find velocity. 
So if the change in momentum is going to be equal to m times the change in velocity. So we found that the change in momentum is 80 kilograms meters per second. So let's solve this for the change in velocity. So the change in velocity is going to be the change in momentum divided by the mass. So the change in momentum is 80.0 kilograms meters per second. We just figured that out. Divided by the change by the mass, which is one kilogram. Right? And you'll notice that the kilograms cancel out and we're left with meters per second. And so now we have 80 divided by one, so it's just 80. 0 0.0 meters per second, which since V initial is zero, this is also equal to the final speed. So that's how fast it's going. All right, so um, the avocado is going at 80 meters per second after this impulse. What is the force needed to accelerate a bike, a 60 kilogram bike from rest to 20 meters per second in 10 seconds? So how much force do I need that? There's a few ways to do it, but let's do it using momentum and impulse. So let's write down everything we know. So the bike starts at rest and it ends at 20 meters per second. And the mass of the bike is 60 kilograms. And this force, this happens over 10 seconds. All right, so I'm gonna go from zero to 20 in 10 seconds. It seems like a lot for a bike, but why not? Uh, so what is the force needed to accelerate? So let's see. So I have here, I can say that the force is equal to dp dt, right? Or just delta p over delta t. And we can use this to figure everything out. So p final minus p initial all over uh, the change in time. So P final is M V final minus P initial is M V initial all over Delta T. And we know that this one here is going to be zero because it's initially at rest. And so when I plug in all the numbers, I plug in 60 kilograms for, for the mass. I plug in 20 meters per second for V final. I plug in 10 seconds for the time and I end up with 120 Newtons. Now it's asking what is the momentum at the end? Well, we know the final speed and we know the mass, so that's easy. It's m v final, right? You just take the mass times v final and that just becomes 1200 kilograms meters per second. Find the change in momentum of a 12, uh, 1120 kilogram car that increases its speed from five meters per second, I should say meters per second, to 15 meters per second over 12 seconds. So that'll be part A, and then part B will be, what is the force needed to do this? Well, let's write down all our knowns again, right? So we have the mass is 1,120 kilograms. We have V initial is five meters per second. I'm gonna assume three sig figs here. V final is 15.0 meters per second the amount of time this all happens in is 12 seconds. All right, so we have a car initially going slowly, and then you exert a force on it for a certain while, a certain amount of time, and then the car is moving faster afterwards. So let's figure it out. So the change in momentum. So change in momentum it's just gonna be m times the change in velocity. So we can do that. The mass is 1,120 kilograms. And the change in velocity, well, it goes to 15 meters per second from five meters per second, right? So I do 15 minus five, that's 10. I just end up with 11,200 kilograms meters per second. So that's the change in momentum. I just did a momentum final minus momentum initial. So how about the force needed to do this. Well, force is equal to change in momentum divided by change in time. So change in momentum is one, one, two, zero, zero. We just calculated that kilograms and meters per second. And the amount of time is 12 seconds. So that works out to about 933 Newtons. 
So if this car was going at five meters per second and I wanted to accelerate it to 15 meters per second within 12 seconds, I would need 933 newtons if it was a constant force the whole time. Here, a 1250 kilogram car is moving at 17.9 meters per second and it slams into a wall and it comes to rest in like a quarter of a second approximately, right? Find the magnitude of the impulse. So this sucker is moving and then it just comes to a stop really, really quickly. Let's write down our knowns. It's initially moving at 1240 meters per second and it stops, right? Over the course of a very short period of time, two, seven, six seconds. That does not look like fun. Uh, the mass of this thing is 1240 kilograms. Okay, so going fast and then it stops very, very quickly. So let's do some calculations. So what is the change in velocity here? Well, it's going to be V final minus V initial, which works out to about minus 17.9 meters per second. We don't want to worry about that minus sign right yet. We're just looking at the magnitude of these things, right? So we're just going to use 17.9. And so J is the, uh, the momentum. So the momentum is going to be the change in momentum. Sorry, the impulse is going to be the change in momentum, which is m times the change in velocity. So if I plug in 17.9 meters per second, and I plug in the mass of 1240 kilograms, I get approximately 22196 kilograms meters per second. That would be, you know, that would be negative because it would be in the negative direction, but it just asks for the magnitude for this case. So now it asks, what is the force that the wall exerts on the car to make this happen? It's going to be a big force, right? Uh, so B, it asks, what is the force? So we can use, since we know everything else, we can use that the impulse is equal to the force times delta T. So the force is going to be equal to the impulse divided by delta T. Our impulse is given there 22196 kilograms meters per second divided by delta T, which is 0.275, and we get about 80,700 newtons. That's a big force to stop that car in a short period of time. So I'd like to do uh, one last example here. The classic in momentum. We have a 140 gram baseball approaching a bat at 32.3 meters per second. So it's coming in fast. The batter imparts a 12 kilogram meter per second impulse on it in the opposite direction. So what is the ball's new speed? So here, I'm gonna do this with plus and minus signs uh, so that we can sort of see what's happening. Uh, let me start by writing down all our knowns, uh, and you'll see why I'm using the minus signs in this case. So the mass is, it's asking, you know, what is the ball's new speed after the collision, right? This is the first question. So the mass is 0 .0, 0 0.145 kilograms. Uh, v initial, we're gonna assume it's going in the positive direction to begin with. So we're gonna say it's, oops, we're gonna say that it's 32.3 meters per second in the opposite direction. And uh, in the positive direction. And we're told that the impulse is in the opposite direction. So I'm going to say the impulse is minus 12.0 kilograms meters per second. And we're trying to find, you know, for A, we're trying to find what V final is. So keep in mind, here's, here's the ball, right? And it's got some initial speed in that direction. And we're assuming after the collision with the bat, so this is like before, and I believe, we'll see after we do the calculation, that afterwards it'll have some velocity in the opposite direction, right? After. So let's see if we can calculate that. So uh, best way to do it, start with J is equal to change in momentum. So our impulse is equal to a change in momentum. And we want to find V final. So let's plug everything in here. It's uh, it's going to be P final minus P initial, or J is equal to M V final minus M V initial. So let's solve for V final. If I move things around, I solve for V final, you end up with the impulse divided by the mass plus V initial. All right, so I'm going to plug in everything here. For J, it's minus 12.0 
kilograms meters per second for the mass it's the mass of a baseball which is 0 0.145 kilograms uh, then to that we add the initial speed which is 32.3 meters per second you notice that the kilograms are going to cancel out here and both terms are going to be in meters per second and when I calculate everything out I end up with minus 50.5 meters per second so after the bat hits the ball the final speed of the object is 50.5 meters per second in the opposite direction or negative 50.5 meters per second um, the second question it asks is a little bit easier it's just saying you know the, if the contact of the ball with the bat is 1.10 milliseconds what is the average force applied to the ball well 1.10 milliseconds is 1.10 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds so I can use this to calculate F right F is equal to impulse divided by time using this equation here and when I plug in everything here, I plug in an impulse of minus 12, I plug in delta T of 1.1 times 10 to the minus 3, and I get minus 0.900 newtons. Okay, so that is the force in the negative direction that causes the ball to change its motion from one direction to the other.